So here we have another pulley problem, a real pulley problem this time, one that has this sort of multiplying effect that pulleys often have. So let's dive into it. So first, uh, so I've got two blocks, I'll call them one and two, both having the same mass m, and I'm given g, and what I want to do is find the acceleration of, of block number two. And I should mention we're making the usual pulley assumptions as well. So let's start with some free body diagrams. Free body diagrams of what? Well, we're going to draw free body diagrams of the masses, right? They're the things that are moving. But when we do the one on the left, we're also going to, well, we're going to be smart about this. We're also going to include uh, the pulley in the free body diagram. Um, so from the left, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take a body as the mass itself plus the pulley, maybe a little bit of that rope connected to the pulley. And for mass number two, I'm just going to draw a free body diagram of that block. And again, a little bit of that rope. So I've got my free body diagrams over here on the left. So this first one, um, let's see, I've got a weight downward. So mg in the minus j hat direction. Again, we're doing, we're treating j hat as positive up. When I draw my free body diagram, I have to draw the things acting externally on my body. So I'm including everything as my body, everything inside this this green rectangle. And I have to ask myself, what are the forces acting external to that? So I wrote the, free, I wrote the, the weight. It's a weight coming from outside. The earth is pulling down on it. What else is acting on it? Well, if you look at the boundary, you know, forces are things that are actually pushing and pulling, usually in direct contact with the object. So if you look at things in direct contact with my green rectangle here, you see right here, I've got some ropes here or pieces of rope that are in direct contact with the stuff inside my rectangle. So at that interface of the contact we see a force from the external ropes pulling on the internal ropes like so. So two forces upward. Now remember because of my usual pulley assumptions the tension in this cable is the same throughout the length of the cable. So in particular, this tension right here, T in the j-hat direction, must be the same as this one right here, T in the j-hat direction. And similarly for this right block, I've got weight pulling down. It's the exact same weight, right? Minus mg j-hat. And then I just, in this one, I just have one tension force pulling up. So let me put that one in there. So now it's time for mass acceleration diagrams. So let's bring these in. And what I'm going to do again is, well, it's pretty much the same thing I did last time. And again, it might rub people the wrong way. I'm going to draw both of these accelerations upward. So I got mass times A1 in the j-hat direction and mass times A2 in the j-hat direction. Now, if you can think about this, what's going on? One of these things probably goes up and the other one probably goes down. But both of these accelerations are unknown right now. They're unknown. So I, when I, my acceleration is unknown, I like to draw it in the direction of, that I call positive and then make the math work out. All right, so it's really what we're going to do. In what we're going to do, it's going to be really important to keep track of signs that, because they can really bite you in the butt. And now I think I'm ready to write equations of motion. So I'm going to just write in right here, Newton. Good friend Newton says the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, block one. And what does that tell me? In the j-hat direction, I've got what? On block one, I've got two tensions pulling upward. I've got a weight pulling downward, minus mg. And this has to equal m1a1. Now for the second block, uh, what do I got? In terms of forces, I just have one tension this time, right? One tension pulling up. I still have the same weight pulling downward, right? The two blocks weigh the same. And this has to equal M, I said M1. Both masses are the same, so just call it M. And this is also M times A2. Now this is a good time to do a little bit of accounting. Notice we have, look at our equations. We have two equations, right? I'll, I'll label them number one and number two. And this is all we get from Newton's second law. We just have two blocks. Everything's moving in just the j-hat direction, so just two equations out of this. 
Now, how many unknowns do we have? When I'm counting unknowns, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the T here. The tension's not known, right? And I've got acceleration of the left block and the acceleration of the right block. All three of those things are unknown. So two equations, three unknowns. I do not have enough information. I do not have enough equations in, in general to solve for these unknowns unless there is some crazy degeneracy. I know a lot of students once they see the equations here, they just want to start go ahead and eliminate things, but you can't. We don't have enough equations to handle these unknowns. So where are we going to go to get more equations or to get more relationships that we can use to to tie these unknowns together? Well, it kind of, we, we mentioned this in the previous problem a bit, but we'll get into this more deeper here. Uh, but we have this string here that wraps around and around. It starts, at the, starts connected to the ceiling wraps around and it's connected to the second block here. Now, that string has to be constant length. Remember, our usual pulley assumption says that string does not stretch. So as block number two is either moving down or up, block number one must be moving either up or down in response in order to keep this string a constant length. The way we're going to get our next equation is to somehow relate the motions of these two blocks in a way that respects the fact that that string or rope has a constant length. Now you might have a good physical intuition. In other words, you might be able to look at this system and say, aha, I know the relationship between A1 and A2. That might be fine. Even if that describes you, what I suggest you do is go through this analysis anyway because I guarantee you there will be a pulley system sometime where you won't know, you won't be able to see what it is intuitively, or maybe your intuition will fail you. So I'm going to show you a rigorous way to get the relationship between these two accelerations. It's a recipe, if you will, that works essentially every time. You just have to apply the recipe right. So here goes. So what I'm going to do is recognize that this length of rope here has to remain constant. That's one of my assumptions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write an expression for that length of the rope. So you notice here I've drawn a line between, or that goes through this, this bottom pulley, or the center of the bottom pulley. And I'm going to make another one up here that goes through the center of the top pulley. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to give this distance right here a name. I'll call it, um, how about S1? Label this length right there. I'm going to call that S2. Now how about a few more lengths? That, that S1 and S2 won't cover the entire length of the rope. So I'll define this little segment right in here. Call that one C1. I've got a little segment of rope here. So look at this, seg this rope here. I've got a C1 and S1. Now I have a little segment that's going around half the circumference of the pulley. C2. And then this little length right here is the same as S1, right? So I don't need a new symbol for that. But I need the new half of the circumference of a pulley. Call that C3. And then I have S2. So now let me clear some stuff away so I have some room to write the length of the rope here. So length of the rope I'm going to call L. And what is that? Let's just start at the top here near the ceiling. I got a little segment called C1. So that piece. And then I have S1 that I want to add to that, so plus S1, and then I go halfway around the the pulley, so plus C2, and now look, I'm going another distance S1, so I can say 2S1 right over there, and um, then C3, and then the final stretch is S2, and there is the entire length of my rope. Now I want you to notice that as these blocks move, some of these segments don't change their length. For example, C1 here is the distance from the ceiling to the middle of the of the second pulley here. That doesn't change, right? The pulley doesn't change its its size. The this this connection here doesn't change its size. So C1 here is a constant. Uh, C2 is a constant. The half circumference of that pulley does not change. C, likewise, C3 is a constant. So I guess what I'm saying is that I chose my, my labeling wisely. This, this one right there, C1, C2, C3, those are all constants. 
And as the blocks move, the only, the only segments of rope that change their length are the S's, the S1 and the S2. Now I want to do a little thought experiment if you'll bear with me. So let's suppose, what if S1 gets larger by two feet, two, so two feet larger. So in other words, block number one is going to move down two feet so that S1 gets two feet larger. Well, in order for the length of the rope to be, remain constant, if S1 is getting two feet larger, then S2 has to get four feet smaller. Do you see it? That's the only way that this rope can remain its length. In fact, you can see it with this pulley. Notice how the block and my hand move in a two to one relationship. That's in order to keep that string a constant length. Now, returning back to my mathematics, let's, um, let's get rid of this. And, and what I want to do is take the time derivative of my, of my length expression right here. And when I do so, what do I get? I just get time derivative of every little piece. So on the left side of the equation, I get L dot equals. And time derivative of a sum is just the sum of the derivatives. So C1 dot plus 2 S1 dot plus C2 dot plus C3 dot. That's supposed to be a 3. Plus S2 dot, right? And of course, we have to keep track of, of which one of these things are constants. The length of the rope, that's not changing in time. So this is supposed to be 0 right there. Constant, if C1 is a constant, it's just the length of that gap right there. So boom, that goes away. S1 can change. C2 cannot. C3 cannot. And what I get after doing this is that 2S1 dot uh, plus S2 dot must be zero. So here's the rate of change. Here's a relationship between the rates of change of those segment lengths. So what this says is that if, if S1, for example, is growing at the rate of two feet per second, then two times two feet per second plus S2 dot has to be equal to zero. So S2 dot would have to be negative four feet per second, right? So if S1 is growing at two feet per second, S2 has to be shrinking at the rate of four feet per second, right? That's how these things are related to each other. And if we want to take a, another time derivative, we can just do that really easily. It's just two times S1 double dot plus, t plus S2 double dot equals zero. Now, why on earth did I just take another derivative? Uh, not just because I like it, but because, remember, we're trying to get a relationship for accelerations, right? S1 double dot, that's a length per time squared. S2 double dot, same units, right? It has units of acceleration. So maybe this is telling us something about those ex accelerations of the blocks. Given that the length of this video is now approaching 13 minutes or so long, I'm going to uh, bring it to a halt here, so, and, and we'll pick up in part B. But where we're going to part B is we're going to, we're going to make that connection between these S double dots and S dots to things that we're interested in, interested in the accelerations of the block. Remember what I needed, I needed some sort of expression that relates A1 and A2 to each other somehow through the constant length of the rope. We're going to go there in part B of this video.